Hello and welcome to the CCNA online training course. This course is uh, 18 modules as you can see, um, starting from the basic very introduction to networks uh, up to um, information on IPv6 which, which is covered in the, the new CCNA exam. Uh, this particular course is the 200-120 which is the newer, newer version so to speak of the exam and it was introduced in 2013. Um, the, the course the course content covers uh, what you would get in ICMD 1 and 2 uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with ICMD Cisco effectively split the CCNA certification into two parts um, this was basically to allow people with perhaps less knowledge less experience uh, to, to go through the certification path uh, in two stages so basically the, the course content is split into two um, the, the, the content of the actual courses are a, a lot more in depth and you effectively take two two exams the ICMD 1 and then the 2 and, and basically once you pass both of those uh, you are CCNA certified this particular training course is for the 200-120 exam which is basically everything in one um, it, it will cover uh, network types, network media, switching fundamentals, TCP IP, IP addressing, uh, routing, WAN technologies, operating and configuring the iOS routers and switches um, and also managing the network environments. Um, part of this course also covers extended switch networks with VLANs, uh, determining, determining IP routes um, which is OSPF and EIGIP Managing IP traffic with access lists, which is very important. Establishing point-to-point -point connections and establishing frame relay connections, which is also uh, valid and current. Personally, I think the 200-120 exam is the better route. Um, it's, it's only one exam and you will not get as much in-depth detail on the topics covered in ICMD 1 and 2. Uh, just, just, just to summarise, this course will cover topics from ICND 1 and 2. Now without further ado let's move on to module 1 which is introduction to networks and data communications. Hello this module 1 uh, introduction to net networks and data communications is the first of, of 18 modules um, and it will cover the basically the following. So it will introduce some very basic networking networking concepts and um, if you have any previous experience in networking or if you've taken a network plus or similar uh, you can probably skim through most of this uh, we still would however recommend that you, you flick through it um, scan through it and, and see and make sure that you understand everything um, you, you should be able to understand the differences the fundamental differences between LANs and WANs and identify the various uh, associated network topologies um, in this module we'll start by saying what do we mean by a network and then we'll explain why networks are important in today's environment uh, we'll then show you show you uh, um, how to distinguish between two important classes of network local area networks or LANs and wide area networks WANs one of the differences between them is in the way in which their network devices are connected together, i.e. the network topology. So we will describe the more important network topologies for LANs and WANs. We can also classify networks by how computers in them cooperate with each other. Here you'll learn the differences between peer-to-peer -peer and client-server networks. This will be followed by some examples of important types of networks in use today. We'll end module 1 by reviewing some of the basic features of data communications, particularly the signaling methods used to date, send data from one network device to another. So, what is a network? Well, in its simplest form, a network consists of two systems directly connected by a physical link, such as a cable or a wireless channel, which allows them to communicate with each other, as shown in the diagram on the screen. So a client application on one system, for example, this on the left, which this would be the oh, sorry, this would be the client machine here. It would request a service such as copying a file from a server. For example, this was the server here, and.
and it would make a simple request like this to copy a file from the server. Most network systems are not directly connected to each other, but make use of intermediate network devices such as hubs, routers and switches. So for example, in, in between here would be some kind of hub or switch that would link, physically link, the two together. Um, a computer which is used for offering services to other computers is usually referred to as a server, i.e. this here. The computer accessing the server or the service is generally referred to as the client. This would be your workstation, your laptop, even mobile device. Strictly speaking, server and client refer to the relevant software processes running on the computers themselves. Modern networking operating systems often allow computers to be configured both as clients and servers. Examples include Microsoft Windows operating systems and various distributions of Linux. Other networking operating systems, notably Novell, Netware, distinguish strictly between client and server software. A workstation is a computer used to run end user applications locally and usually functions as a network client as well. So your desktop at work would, would be classed as a workstation. So why do we need networks? Well, on the screen at the moment are just some of the, the benefits um, and features of modern network environment. Um, so for example, let's start with uh, resource sharing. Uh, this means shared resources can be added as needed. Networks can grow organically, avoiding underutilization of resources and resource bottlenecks. Disk storage and printers are amongst the most common shared network resources. So this would typically be um, the server in, in, in your, in, at, your, at work in your comms room. Uh, let's go for what's next. Let's, data sharing. Data sharing, uh, so basically sharing data is probably the largest single benefit of network computing. With the coming of the internet, data sharing has achieved global dimensions. So with the dawn of Dropbox, um, you send it, and, and many other data sharing applications, you can, you, you can share your data securely with just about anyone who's connected to the internet. Application sharing. Servers running terminal services software can offer applications such as word processing to remote clients. Such applications no longer to need to be installed on your PC in an organization. Um, applications can also be distributed so that different parts of an application can run on separate computers. So uh, what, what, what we mean there is that um, nowadays you can have what's known as a thin client where, where you won't need Office installed on your computer but when, when you make a request, it will go off to the server and it will effectively download what is required to run Office or run Excel or PowerPoint so, and so forth. Uh, moving on, data integrity. When users need to access and modify data, um, it's vital that the data is managed consistently to maintain its integrity. If two users were allowed to modify the same record in a database simultaneously, for example, the result would usually be corruption of the database. Server-based data management systems enforce this necessary discipline to ensure that this does not happen. And then, obviously, centralized backups of data also prevent data being lost through accident, negligence, or malicious action. Important one, security. Server-based networks can enforce secure access to network resources. Users are validated by supplying a username and password, or even fingerprint with a retinal scan. Once validated, their access to network resources can be restricted by the network administrator. Resilience. In a network environment, it's possible to provide network multiple paths to multiple servers. One aim of network design should be to avoid single points of failure, and we'll cover this later on in the course. Um, this allows the organization to continue to function effectively in the event of a breakdown of individual components. Load balancing. You've seen the multiple paths in the network provide resilience. 
they can also share the traffic load as well. Other examples of load balancing in a, in a network include clusters of servers offering the same services to clients. So in a very busy environment, you'll have multiple computers serving the same application or, or service, and they will, both, they will all share amongst them the demand from the clients requesting the service uh, fr from them, basically. Communication. Email. Email has transformed the way businesses uh, communicate, even, even privately. At the end of the day, who hasn't got an email address these days? It would be hard to overestimate the importance of this network, network application. More recently, personal communications have been revolutionized through the use of social networking sites such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, and so on and so forth. When describing the way in which systems are networked together, you'll find it useful to distinguish between local area networks and wide area networks. As the name implies, LANs cover shorter distances than WANs, typically from a few metres to a few thousand metres. There's no limit on the distances covered by WANs, although there may be limits on individual WAN links. However, there's an even more fundamental difference between LANs and WANs, and that is the way they are connected together. In a LAN, in a LAN um, each network host is connected to a common communication channel, such as an Ethernet hub, shown in um, the diagram on the screen. Um, they all connect to the same channel, so therefore each host can communicate directly with any other host. Because of this, LAN technologies are often described as broadcast technologies, where one host can send data, which can be picked up by every other host. On the next slide, we talk about WANs. Um, so by contrast, these WANs are characterized by point-to-point -point links between hosts. WAN technologies are often referred to as point-to-point -point technologies. Nowadays, WANs are rarely used to connect end stations directly. Um, they're typically, uh, they, they provide the long distance links between routers. Um, this allows remote LANs to communicate with each other, as, as described in the next uh, slide. So here we have London LAN and New York LAN, perhaps within the same organization, but they're, they're separated by, by, via a WAN link, as you can see in the middle. So the, the, low, the most commonly used LAN technologies today are various implementations of Ethernet, as well as wireless LANs nowadays, which are often integrated within LANs themselves. We shall look at briefly Token Ring, although this is largely a legacy technology, therefore not, not commonplace at all. So what you see on the, on the screen at the moment uh, is, is a basic earlier implementation of Ethernet. Uh, and this is where hosts connected directly to a coaxial cable, similar to a structure, similar structure to like a TV area you'd find in a home. Uh, and these were connected via network adapters, which were effectively radio frequency transmitter receivers. Um, this arrangement provided inconvenient for two main reasons. Firstly, a single Ethernet cable had to connect all of the stations together. Uh, secondly, inserting a new host into the network. I, a, a new PC or replacing one or adding to network involved breaking the, the cable connection resulting in a temporary loss of network connectivity so, so not very efficient to be honest um, most modern implementations use a hub or a switch as the common communication channel similar to this implementation here where all of the computers would connect to to a centralized switch so therefore you could add and remove hosts on a network without interrupting everybody else. Let's just move back to the slide. Um, so so you, you will basically learn the difference between hubs and switches later in this course. Uh, fundamental difference, they work in similar ways but, but yet in the same breath they are different uh, and very important. Um, so the end stations are usually connected to a wall socket, so your computer would be connected via RJ45 Cat5 cable uh, to, to a wall. Um, it's called an RJ45 socket. 
and that socket behind will have a cable running to a patch panel which would be in your comms room so to speak. This patch panel is a simple device that allows individual wall sockets spread around your office for example to be connected to particular ports on the hub or switch that you may also have in the comms room. Wireless LANs. <coughs> Excuse me. Computers which form part of a wireless LAN or WLAN use network network adapters which can send and receive radio signals. There are two main types of WLAN. A temporary, unstructured, ad hoc WLAN can be formed when mobile computers equipped with wireless network adapters come into close proximity, similar to what you see now on the screen. Um, ad hoc LANs are also referred to as independent or peer-to-peer -peer W LANs. For example, Bluetooth devices typically take part in ad hoc W LANs. Moving on, what you see in front of you at the moment is infrastructure WAN. This is more popular, more commonplace. Um, it uses fixed wireless network access points. Computers with wireless network adapters can use them as wireless hubs. The network access points can be connected onto the cabled office Ethernet infrastructure um, and they're often used to integrate mobile wireless computers into an office LAN. So basically uh, what you see is this would be um, Wi-Fi access point, these three here perhaps spread across a big office and um, this perhaps uh, these are wireless, wireless um, uh, these are laptops could even be mobile phone they, they would connect to the Wi-Fi access point which is connected to the switch here and therefore this switch is also connected to the rest of the network yeah and that's basically an infrastructure WLAN so just to summarize in an ad hoc WLAN situation end stations can send directly to each other However, in an infrastructure WLAN like you see now, each station sends data to the wireless access point which forwards it to the other end stations. Security is a concern with all wireless LANs owing to the open nature of the channel. When configuring a WLAN you should take care to ensure that secure authentication and encryption protocols are used. So basically that the main ones are, are uh, WEP, um, and WPA. Um, I would certainly not use WEP as it's very, very susceptible to hacking, um, remarkably easy to hack. So I would either use WPA or WPA uh, with pre shared key. Pre shared key. <coughs> so just briefly talking about Token Ring. Um, in a Token Ring network, as you can see on the screen, when one station sends data to another, the data travels all the way around the ring, being picked up by the destination station on the way. In practice, all the stations are connected to a token ring hub, or in other words, an MSAU, stands for Multi-Station Access Unit, the hub acting as the ring. The situation is similar to that shown in uh, a previous slide for an Ethernet hub. So the multi-station access unit would act like that, one uh, similar similar to that. As, as I said, token ring is very rare nowadays and uh, not used, but it, it's good to know uh, to be aware of how it works. By the topology of a network, we mean the way in which the network devices are connected to each other without regard for other factors such as speed of the links or the distances between the network devices themselves. These other factors are important, but there, are, there, there is a lot we can learn about the network and simply from its, simply from its topology. As you can see, you've got bus, ring, star, hybrid and tree. And I'll go through each one um, briefly so you're familiar with each one. So let's start with bus. Okay, so here, in the early days of Ethernet, uh, each end station was connected to an Ethernet cable, which provided a common channel for each station to send or receive data. Um, only one station could transmit at any time, and its data could be received by any other station connected to the to Ethernet cable. Um, this allowed any station to broadcast to all other stations on the LAN. Um, 
later you'll see how data can be addressed to a particular station so that it is ignored by all other stations except the, the target. Let's look at ring. In the case of token ring, we have seen that data is passed in a ring from one station to another. However, the network is physically connected in a star topology via central hub or MSAU. Again, there's a difference between the logical topology, which determines how the network behaves, and its physical top topology. Excuse me. Let's look at star. Earlier, we saw that Ethernet networks no longer need to be connected via a common Ethernet cable using physical bus topology. They can be connected to a hub or a switch in a physical star topology, as shown on the screen now. So in the center is effectively the switch. In this case, the Ethernet network continues to function as if it was still connected using a bus topology. Hybrid. Um, when a network has a logical topology which is different from its physical topology, we sometimes say it has a hybrid topology. However, this term is also used to describe networks which have combinations of different physical topologies. Tree. The simplest physical topology in a LAN is the star topology. However, there are other possibilities. As you can see on the screen, a number of hubs have been connected together to form the LAN. This is a, is a typical example of tree topology, as you can see that the branches out. A tree topology is one without any loops, i.e. there is only one path between any two points on the network. Wireless LANs, such as infrastructure WLANs, which use, an which use an access point, have a logical bus topology, and a typical, or sorry, and a typically physical star or tree topology. Ad hoc WLANs have a mesh topology, which is more typical of WANs and is covered in the following section. Ad hoc WLANs are not considered in detail in this course and any further mention of WLANs should be taken as referring to infrastructure WLANs unless otherwise stated. So this form of networking typically involves the connection of systems across large distances, usually through telecommunication links between pairs of systems. So what you see on the screen uh, are point-to-point -point links um, and point to multi-point links where a single interface on one system is connected to a number of other systems for example excuse me for example frame relay WAN links are usually supplied by telecommunication service providers such as BT some links are on demand or dial up these are only activated as needed and are charged by the time used nowadays it's usually always on which means always available uh, and, and you're usually charged a monthly line rental um, for the privilege of having an always on connection. The main types of WAN links, uh, as you can see, are on screen. Um, some technologies like Frame Relay can offer on demand and always on connections, it can offer you, basically offer you a choice. We cover WAN technologies in more detail later on in this course. As we've seen, um, WANs are characterized by point-to-point -point or point-to-multipoint links. These can be com combined to make a variety of different topologies, as you can see. Um, note that the star and chain topologies are, are just special cases of the tree topology, or in other words, a loop-free network. The choice of topology is often influenced by the technology available, the options being offered by the telecommunication service providers and distances involved. Um, it's good to know, but generally they, they, they will provide you with the right solution for you or, or whatever is available, um, so to speak. So here's just a, a slide on uh, WAN topology considerations. Uh, they're the four main, main um, considerations you need to be aware of. Resilience, um, number of hops, number of links, and connections to node. Uh, perhaps what I suggest is, is you pause, pause the video and read through each one um, and just familiarize yourself with it before we move on. So in the previous sections 
we have seen how network nodes can be connected together. Now we need to look at what those nodes do in the network. So in other words, what is the role of a node or computer in the network and what is its relationship to the other nodes or computers on the network? So there are two main models of cooperative networking shown on the screen. You, you have peer-to-peer -peer networks and client-server networks. Although it's common to refer to a computer on a network as a server or a client, in these terms, more properly refer to the software processes running on the computer. Within a single network, there may be instances of each of these models. The network does not have to conform exclusively to one model. Sorry, jumped ahead there. So, um, in a peer-to-peer -peer environment on the left, as you can see, um, each system is, at, is capable of offering services to other systems, whilst also being able to request services from other systems. So, for example, a simple network consist of two, consisting of two systems, um, system A on the left, which is a shared printer, A here, and uh, access data files held on system B, the shared data, data files here, in this instance, system A is acting as the client and system B is acting as the server. However, system B can send uh, print jobs for execution on system A's printer. In this instance, system A is acting as the server, system B is acting as the client. Peer-to-peer -peer systems usually run operating systems and applications that are capable of being configured as clients or server. So moving on to the, to, to the image on the right, client-server network. Uh, so in a client-server network environment, the roles of systems are more clearly defined. Some services will only be available on some systems. These systems will run specialized operating systems, such as wi Windows Server, Exchange, Novell Netware Server, and applications like SQL, um, Exchange, or some database software. Other systems will run operating systems, su systems such as Windows 8, Windows 7, designed primarily to support local applications and client access to network services. So basically the software, the operating system that, that you would find on your laptop or your desktop computer. Uh, so on this, on this uh, image on the right, one system acts as a file server to the network while the others that offers print services so this is the ser this is the server here this would be the file server and these all of, all of these clients here will, will, would make requests to any one any one of these servers uh, and this is the, the client server relationship this approach has a number of advantages it allows resources to be concentrated on the server systems where they are needed. Uh, some more of the more benefits uh, of client-server network are listed in uh, the following table. So client-server advantages, uh, ease of management, the fact that resources are concentrated on fewer servers make, makes for easier and more centralized management. Uh, ease of use, uh, users need only be authenticated by a single logon server without the need to supply security credentials to each system they need to access. Um, enhanced security, assigning permissions to a single set of authenticated users makes for easier and better security management. Centralized security is the most important feature distinguishing client-server networks from peer-to-peer -peer networks. It, it's, the, it's the biggest thing that separates the two. Um, data integrity, um, well, it, it's easier to protect and back up important data files if they are kept on a few dedicated servers. Server-based applications such as Microsoft SQL allow centralized data to be modified by, by multiple clients without the danger of, of data corruption caused, for example, by two clients attempting to modify the same data record simultaneously. Um, Having said that, on the downside, client server systems are generally more expensive and require more knowledgeable staff to configure and maintain them. That's, that's where us IT people come in. <laughs> Moving on to the basics of data communications. Um, 
Networks consist of, of devices connected by communication channels, as, as, as I've touched on earlier. Data sent from one device to another across the communication channel is transmitted as bits, or in other words, binary, ones and zeros, encoded in some electron magnetic signal. Excuse me. The most widely used communication channels are shown in the table that you can see at the moment. The term copper includes any metallic wire which carries an electronic, electric current. We're going to look at some basic but important features of data links. So the speed, the direction of flow, the method of signaling and multiplexing, uh, which is how multiple data channels can be carried out by a single physical link. So the, the speed of a data link is measured by the number of bits that can be transmitted across it per second. The basic unit is bit per second. This can be written as bits per second, as you can see on the screen, uh, the second line down, um, BPS. The last, the last one is the most uh, common usage, uh, which is this one here. Uh, you should how you should be wary uh, that that it's a lowercase b, as the capital B represents a byte. This convention is not always followed, but so take care when reading specifications. Um, speed is normally expressed in in more convenient multiples of uh, bits per second, as shown in the table below. Uh, if you note also the word billion used to mean a million million in Britain. The modern internationally accepted usage is that it means a thousand million. Direction. So the, the direction of data flow and the order in which transmission can occur are also important. Three important cases are shown in the next slide. So direction of data flow and the order in which transmission can occur are also important. Three important cases are shown on the, on the slide on the screen. So the first one is simplex. In this case, data flow is one way. An example of this is light traveling through a fiber optic fiber cable. Fiber optic cables offering full duplex transmission usually comprise of two fibers, one for each direction of travel. Half duplex. Data can travel through this channel in either direction, but in only one direction at a time. An example of this is an Ethernet network using a hub. Any station can send data, but only one station at a time can send at that time. This is also true of some wireless LANs. Later in this course, you'll see that the Ethernet networks that use switches instead of hubs can support full duplex transmission. The final uh, method or direction is full duplex. This consists of two-way simultaneous transmission and is usually accomplished by having two channels in the same physical link or by combining one or more wire or fiber in a cable. Although a single optical fiber usually carries signals in just one direction, modern fiber optic systems using wave division multiplexing or WDM, which is described later in this module, can support full duplex transmission on a single fiber by using two different wavelengths of light, one for each direction of transmission. Moving on to signaling, um, data sent across a physical link consists of bits, binary ones and zeros, which are encoded in an electromagnetic signal. A typical way of doing this is by taking an, an electromagnetic wave for example radio wave or an alternating voltage on a wire or a light beam and modulating it in different ways to represent a binary one or binary zero. A simple wave pattern shown on the screen now. This represents a snapshot of, a, of the wave at a particular moment in time. It shows a variation of some property, for example voltage in the case of an alternating electric current as you move along the wave. The wave consists of a repeating pattern of peaks and troughs. The distance between two successive peaks, or for another word, 
one complete cycle is called the wavelength. This is usually represented by the Greek letter lambda. The maximum height of a wave is called its amplitude. This type of wave pattern is often called, excuse me, this type of wave pattern is often called a sine wave because it can be represented by the mathematical sine function. The basic unit of wavelength is in the meter. Wavelengths are normally expressed in more convenient multiples of meters, shown in the table below. There is a considerable variation in the wavelengths used in electromagnetic signaling. The wavelength of the signals used in the early forms of Ethernet was approximately 15 meters. Modern wireless LANs use radio signals with late wavelengths near to one centimeter, and fiber optic networks use light, light with wavelengths near to a micron, though these are usually quoted in nanometers. The height of the wave does not just vary over distance. At a given point in space, it also varies over time. The number of cycles per second is known as the frequency of the wave which is often represented by the letter F, or sometimes by the Greek letter NU. The basic unit of frequency is the hertz. So one hertz is equal to one cycle per second. Frequencies are normally expressed in more convenient multiples of hertz. For example, this table here. The wavelength and frequency of a wave are related to its speed. And the letter C is often used as a symbol for the speed of a wave. And I've put on there the calculation uh, to calculate speed. Um, so speed is measured in meters per second, written as m slash sec or ms or ms to the power of minus one. Um, speed of electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves is roughly um, 300,000 kilometers per second. Note that the speed of a wave is not the same as the speed of data transmissions. This will depend on how quickly the basic wave pattern can be modulated and is measured in bits per second. On the slide now we, we can see amplitude modulation or in other words AM. One way of modulating the basic wave pattern is to use different amplitudes to represent 1 and 0. You can see a scheme which uses a large amplitude to encode a bit 1 and a smaller amplitude to encode a bit 0. AM electrical and wireless signals are prone to interference from other sources of EM radiation. As the amplitude of the interference will be simply added to the amplitude of the signal and so therefore distort it. Often the case with ADSL, um, if, if there is interference in the comms cabinet, um, generally uh, it's to do with the AM signal, A amplitude modulation, um, and that, that, that can often cause uh, disconnections or poor speeds. Moving on, frequency modulation. The frequency of a signal can also be modulated to carry data. In the example on the screen, a lower frequency represents a bit 1, whilst a higher frequency represents a bit 0. FM electrical and wireless signals are less prone to interference than AM signals. Although the amplitude of any potential interference will be added to the amplitude of the signal, this does not damage the data as such, as frequency is being used for signalling. It's less likely um, that the potential interference will use exactly the same frequencies being employed by the FM signalling. However, this can happen in WLANs, as you'll see later. Phase modulation. Another way of encoding a digital signal is to use shifts in the wave pattern, or in other words, phase changes. This is known as phase shift keying, or PSK. On the screen, you'll see a wave pattern shifted with respect to the original shown dotted represents a bit one while the no shift represents a bit zero ethernet signaling uses a version of psk variation is to use a shift with respect to the wave pattern immediately preceding 
rather than to the original waveform. This is known as the differential PSK on the screen now. Token ring signaling uses a version of differential PSK. Something to note, the acronym PSK also stands for pre-shared key, so don't confuse this. A technique, um, this is a technique used by some forms of encryption. Unfortunately, this is not the only example of an IT term having more than one meaning, though which meaning it's intended should be clear from the context. Phase amplitude modulation. Um, by using a combination of encoding techniques, faster data transfer can be achieved. In this case, both the amplitude and the phase of the signal are being modulated, resulting in twice the speed of each method on its own. Each change is being used to encode two bits, the first corresponding to the amplitude, the second to the phase change. Modems often use similar techniques to increase data transfer rates. Now we move on to multiplexing. Um, we've already said that, that more than one channel can be carried over one physical link. One way of doing this is to use different frequencies as the carriers for the signal on each channel, hence multiplexing. Baseband transmission sends data across a physical link using only one carrier frequency. There is only one channel on the link. An example of this is an Ethernet network using a hub. Whereas broadband transmission occurs when there is more than one channel on the link, each with its own frequency. So therefore data can be transferred simultaneously across the channels. An example of this is cable TV, which is a, which is a classic example of broadband transmission. Frequency division multiplexing is basically broadband transmission over a single physical link and this can be achieved by using a multiplexer to take a number of digital inputs and encoding each using a different frequency. At the other end of the line a demultiplexer or demux splits the data into different digital outputs. Usually the physical link is used to support data channels in both directions and the device at each end is a multiplexer or demultiplexer also referred simply as a MUX. This, this is a diagram explaining what I've just mentioned um, about frequency division multiplexing. Um, time division multiplexing is another way of implementing multiplexing um, but this time it, 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 it's to send data from each input stream in successive time slices. There is a variation on this technique called statistical time division multiplexing, which allows more time slices to be given to the busiest channels. Finally, we have wave division multiplexing. This is a variation of FDM, or for fiber optic networks. Light signals of different wavelengths are used to carry the data across separate channels. However, we have seen that frequency and wavelength are related, so this is effectively FDM. The reason why the term wavelength is, is used is that it is usual to quote the wavelength rather than the frequency when specifying what kind of light is being used. There are two main categories of WDM. Coarse slash conventional WDM and dense WDM. They differ in how many different wavelengths are used and hence how many different signals can be transmitted simultaneously. CWDM systems typically use up to eight different wavelengths, whilst DWDM systems carry many more. We'll see examples of this later on in the course. So there we have it, uh, the end of module one. So just to recap and review, um, basically having completed this module, you should be able to see, see the following points and uh, I suggest you pause pause this, um, this this slide and make sure you go over and you understand all of these basic concepts. Some of them are quite quite in depth uh, but obviously if you spend your time go through go through what I've said on the slides um, it should get you through and uh, we'll see you on module two which is about network protocols and network devices. Thanks.